a good deal of walking now, straight line, straight down this highway until I get to town of Gna. And that's where Napoleon's last headquarters were. He spent the evening before the battle there, spent the night, and in the morning at breakfast, laid out his plan of battle, his order of battle to his marshals. I believe it is he, he abandoned the battlefield to get to fall back to Ganap before he finally sort of abandoned his army and headed back to Paris. Over to, the, over to the left is the area of the Prussian advance. The Prussians came in from Wellington's left. And when Napoleon saw the first forces from the Prussian army approaching onto the battlefield, he knew he was in a race against time. He was confident he could beat Wellington and he was confident he could beat Blucher, but not the combined armies. So when he saw the first approaches of the Prussian army onto the extreme left of the Allied forces line, he knew he was in a race against time. And so all his decision making, from then on, his decisions and the actions of his army had to be in haste. He had to beat Wellington before Blucher and the Prussians could join forces. So with the Prussians coming in on the Allied left, the French right, there was huge battles all afternoon for control of the village of Plancenois. Obviously, I'm going to be saying that wrong. Please, please tell me how to pronounce it. In the, please leave a comment and tell me how I should be saying it. But it's the best I can come up with. But Plancenois, P-L-A-N-C-E-N-O-I-T. The village was fought over backward and forward. The momentum of the battle between the Prussians and the French ebbed and flowed. Eventually, the Prussians got the upper hand and were able to come in on the French right With the failure of the old guard assault, the battle for Napoleon was done. To show you this sign, I just saw my long walk. Some well known names Brussels, all in kilometres, of course, Waterloo, Gunner, Gunner, six kilometres. I don't know why is that still about two and a half miles Salwa Theatre. Just walking along I just seen this look lovely looking building. The farm of Hamoy du Roy and these high arched entranceways seem to be very much typical of this area. Maybe it's for the, the wagons loaded high with hay at harvest time to go through to the yard. But when you see the old walls, the old buildings, you just, I just think, was that one there at the time of Waterloo. Did they witness the retreating French army? So I've made it. Napoleon's last headquarters. This is the farm. Let's go explore. If walls could talk, 
got to be the original stone. You'd think these supports have been put in since. It's an area of collapsed wall here. Well, they're putting their window in. Well, if this was Napoleon's headquarters, all the French army would have been filing past here. The Kalu farm. Yeah, the flag of Napoleon. Looks like you go through this gateway here, so. Let's have a look. Apparently it's open every day, 17th and 18th of June, 1885. Museum, toilets. So the farm yard. That's take a look at some of these pictures. after the battle surgeons working on the wounded oh we yeah, the army bivouacking around this area on the night before the battle cooking so what we have here Pierre Brazine's tombstone Pierre Brazine was an officer in the 112th line regiment of the Imperial Army from 1809 to 1815 he was wounded at Mont Saint Jean during the Battle of Waterloo he was awarded the Legion of Honour and was a recipient of the Medal of St Helena. I wonder if he went with Napoleon to St Helena into exile. Is this just the stone? that's been brought here. He didn't die till 1865. And here I saw one of these buildings, these small chapel buildings, yesterday. And I wasn't quite sure what it was all about. The bones from the battlefield are there. These buildings are called ossuaries. O double S U A R Y. And I haven't looked up the definition of an ossuary, but maybe they were a place to come and say a prayer. We'll no doubt find out in the bath in the museum about those about those bones there. Very large bones, like legs. The ossuary containing bones that were found on the battlefield during excavation or works. It was erected in 1912. This small and moving monument bears the inscription, often for the emperor, always for the fatherland.
the farmyard. It's difficult to imagine the noise and the tumult in this farmyard on the evening of the 17th of June. Carriages being parked alongside the walls, luggage being unloaded, horses being unbridled. The noise made by the soldiers busying themselves around the well and the barn. And on top of this, the endless downpour of rain. It's through here to the verger, they call it. Which looks like the pasture area is a picture of a sheep with. So this is a memorial. The Chasseurs, Imperial Guard. The 1st Battalion, 1st Regiment, bivouacked here. And then some of the, the battle honours, Marengo, Ulm, Austerlitz, Aina, Friedland, Esslin, Wagaran, Smolensk, Moscow, Anna, Montmeyer Isle. So the Imperial Guard bivouacked here next to the Emperor inside this building. Right, I think it's time that we went into the museum. This is very interesting. So it's saying the two eagles either side of me and the balcony that I'm leaning on. The balcony is from a corner room occupied by Victor Hugo in the Hotel de Colonnes at Mont Saint Jean, where he resided between May 15th and July 14th, 1861. It is here that he wrote the well known chapter. Refer relating the Battle of Waterloo of his novel Les Miserables. Les Miserables. Cast iron eagles are from the Brussels mansions ho mansion house of Prince Victor Napoleon. Both buildings shared a common destiny. They were demolished during the 60s. Napoleon and Hugo are long gone, but the balcony and the eagles are now together at this museum, the former Kalu farm. So this is the balcony. Victor Hugo would have opened his door, his hotel door, leaned on the balcony and cast iron eagles. Wow. Right. Let us, let us go inside. Ticket office. Oh, oh yeah. So this is Kalu Farm at the time of the battle. So this room with the operations room on the eve of the battle. of Napoleon found in the bag of a soldier on the battlefield. Pipe, pipe cleaner belonging to a soldier and a tobacco box. This is great. I've got this museum entirely to myself. The living room. So the Emperor's bedroom was set up in the living room of the farm. The campaign furniture was frugal, an iron folding bed, a silver wash basin his travel kit, a folding leather table and chair, and portfolios containing papers and maps. He ate sparingly, worked with a will and slept little, all through this short night confined to his room due to the terrible weather. 
Napoleon was constantly disturbed by messages and reports of ongoing missions. Quite a large room. So it was the living room, so it would be a large room in the house. Napoleon slept here. All he could hear was the rain outside the windows, the sound of his army. The original model for the bronze statue of Napoleon in the courtyard of the Hotel des Invalides in Paris. Napoleon the Grand. Portable iron folding bed, four poles to carry the canopy, small copper vases, serving as nuts to join the poles to the feet of the bed, rings to keep the crossbars straight, compass shaped struts to consolidate and maintain the right angle. In this display cabinet we've got a ring that belonged to the Emperor and it was retrieved from out of his sedan coach near here in Guinea as he was trying to make his, 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 his ride away in his coach. Apparently this got bogged down and had to be abandoned and the coach was looted and this ring was found. This is a, an authenticated note with Napoleon's signature on. And here in this medallion, there is a lock of the Emperor's hair. So it was here, in this very small living room, caught lock fire burning, rain, torrential downpours of rain all through the night. Napoleon spent the eve of what was. Messengers coming to and fro through the night with updates of enemy positions and results of missions. We're here in the kitchen of the old farm, right next door, where the Emperor slept. And this was where he had his morning conference on June the 18th, 1815. These three oak tables are genuine. They were the 16th tables of carved oak. They belonged to the farmer and were used by the emperor on the morning of June 18th. So you can literally touch where the Emperor would have lent. As dawn broke, the skies cleared. Emperor breakfasted at about 8 o'clock in the kitchen with younger brother Prince Jerome and his marshals and aide-de-camp. When the meal was over, the table was cleared and covered with a tarp carpet from Tone, upon which the maps for the coming battle were spread. During the war council, Despite the doubts expressed by his closest generals, the Emperor showed great optimism. He was convinced that victory would not escape him. As was his wont, ever resolute, he made his decisions alone. And this is the carpet that was used to cover the tables upon which the campaign maps were unfolded. I believe this. Touching history. It's amazing. I think you see here, I've got like an English guide as well, which gives me a bit of commentary during the, the war crimes. So they have the fireplace here, Nepal, Napoleon City, opposite the fireplace. 
So he would have been sitting here. Let's touch this bit of the top of the oak table. The palm prints of the Emperor. This is actually a preliminary draft, bronze draft for the Eagle Expiring Monument, which we saw earlier at the scene of the Old Guard's last stand. The Haz. So this is the Hazar's room. The battlefields of the Napoleonic Wars were a dreadful sight to behold. Cannonballs smashed and shattered limbs, bullets slammed into bodies, and during attacks, bayonets gutted. During cavalry charges, sabres sliced and spears pierced. Overwhelmed by the large numbers of wounded, surgeons operated without anaesthetics. They sewed up wounds, dislocated shoulders, knees and hips, and amputated non-stop, often taking just a few minutes. Amazingly skillful, they managed to achieve a remarkably high rate of survival. What this display cabinet is saying is that soldiers used to make their own bullets, and these are bullet moulds. Now, the soldiers would rip open the cartridge containing the powder before proceeding to load the weapon. And it said this spurred many young people to pull out their own teeth in order to avoid conscription. Cuirassier Sabre, four branched guard. One, two, three, four. Dated September 1814. And a breastplate the cuirass and apparently these would have their identification numbers on the on the back which is why they've been able to when some have been recovered from the battlefield they've known exactly who it belonged to and there's a well-known one with a big hole where a cannonball has gone straight through it french dragoon carbine Cannonballs found on the battlefield. I understand that most of the casualties in the battle were caused by artillery. The French relied on cannonballs such as those, but with the immense rain that had taken place the day before, the cannonballs wouldn't bounce as they hit the ground, so their effectiveness was limited to some degree. The British had shrapnel bombs which would explode over the top of the troops and scatter causing immense casualties to the French. As I've discovered in the, the museum as well, <coughs> this was part of the orchard of the farm and it was here that the elements of the old guard who were designated to guard the headquarters of the emperor where they tried to get to sleep during that night of thunderstorms torrential rain normally they would bivouac in tents but the ground was so sodden and the rain so so heavy that they just had to sleep or try to sleep as best they could Got a little closed off section down here.
the farm that was Napoleon's last headquarters. When the French had retreated and the Prussians arrived, they learned that this farm had been used as a headquarters for Napoleon and determined that their enemy would never again have use of the farm. They set it on fire and it destroyed a great portion of the farm. There used to be a great barn up against that wall. That's gone. So there, fabulous, fabulous little museum is that. I'm glad I made the walk to come here. So it's another one ticked off. Napoleon's last he headquarters building is open every day of the year except Christmas Day and New Year's Day. And here in the little garden area, recreation area. Statue of the Emperor with his eyeglass. The Emperor Napoleon I. You just wonder how many thousands of items of the farmers unearthed down the centuries since the battle. Well, to be a farmer at Waterloo. Livia with the last look of the building. That was the, the body of the, the building. Here there used to be one of those arched gateways. Obviously it's all got, you know, so much of it got destroyed by the Prussians. But the main body of the house, the important bit, where Napoleon slept, where his conference took place on the morning of the battlefield. All his troops, his army, camped in these adjoining fields making preparations to move to Waterloo. And this, this wall was in place back in 1815. And so were these supports, which I thought may have been added since, but in some old pencil engravings, it was showing off the farm. Back in the day, it shows these supports. Wow, amazing. Amazing to be walking so close to history. I hope you enjoyed that look in Napoleon's last HQ. Maybe part of the battlefield trip that not all that many tourists make the effort to come out this far. But it was well worth it, and I'm glad, glad that I've seen, seen the Emperor's bed. Just been in those rooms. We had to touch those, those tables, those Louis XVI tables that was used for his map conference on the morning of the battle. To be able to touch those. Wonderful. This is why I love history. Okay. So I'll see you all a little later. Wherever that may be. Till then, dodger and out.